My name is Mark McGuinness, and this is the 21st Century Creative, the podcast that helps you thrive as a creative professional amid the demands, the distractions, and the opportunities of the 21st century. Welcome to episode nine. This week, I'm thrilled to introduce you to one of my teachers, the legendary voice teacher, Kristin Linklater. I recorded this interview at Kristin's Voice Centre up in the Orkney Islands, north of Scotland, at the end of an intensive course I took with her in May this year. If you're an actor, then quite likely Kristin will need no introduction for you, and you'll be already eager to hear this interview. If you're not, and if Kristin is a new name for you, then you are in for a special treat. Kristin has some very insightful things to say about creativity, authenticity and communication based on a lifetime spent teaching voice work at the highest level. So you'll find it helpful if you do any kind of public speaking at whatever level. And as we discover in the conversation, working on your voice can have a very interesting and very positive effect on your creativity outside of the realm of performance. So even if you're not a speaker or an actor or a performer, listen up. You may be surprised by what you will learn from the interview. This is the first interview on the show I've recorded face-to-face rather than over the internet, which was a really nice experience, and I think it brings a different quality to the conversation. So wherever possible, I'll be looking to record future interviews in person. Okay, as I said a couple of weeks ago, I am now working on season two of the 21st Century Creative, and I want to make it as useful and relevant for you as possible. So now I want to hear from you about what you would like me to cover in future episodes of the show. I've added a suggestion box at 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash contact where you can send me a message to let me know what you think of the show so far and what topics and challenges you would like me to cover in future seasons and future episodes. So, if there's a burning question you'd like to see me address on the show or a particular challenge you're facing in your creative career or business that you'd like some help with, send a message and let me know. I can't promise to reply to every message individually or even to include every request into the show, but I will definitely read every single one carefully and consider them as I put the new shows together. And just to clarify, I'd like to hear about topics and questions and challenges you'd like me to cover on the show. I'm afraid I'm not looking for volunteers to appear on the show, so please don't send me proposals for interviews. You see, because of the format of the show, there's only a very few slots every season, so I'm already having to say no to most of the requests for interviews I'm getting, including some really great ones, so I'd rather not have to say no to any more great proposals this week. Um, Hope you understand that. So, there it is. I've sent a lot of stuff your way during season one, so now it's over to you. Tell me what you want from the 21st Century Creative and I will do my best to deliver it. Go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash contact and send me a message. Over the last couple of years, I've developed a passion for sumo wrestling. In case you're wondering, I'm not taking part. I just watch it on YouTube. I was curious about sumo as it's a survival into modern times of a great Japanese tradition with vestiges of samurai culture. A wrestler called Hakuho is not only the greatest wrestler of the current age, he's regarded as the greatest sumo wrestler of all time. He's won more championships than any other wrestler since records began over 400 years ago, and he's almost got the record for the number of fights won in his career. So every time you watch Hakaho fight, you're watching history in the making. Watching him stride about the ring like a colossus, dispatching other wrestlers, 
often with moves that make it look ridiculously easy. It's hard to imagine him having any weaknesses. It's like watching a statue come to life, except this statue has the skill and dexterity of a ninja. He looks like the epitome of a samurai warrior, except, like a lot of top-ranked wrestlers these days, he's actually a Mongolian who came to Japan in search of fame and fortune. Mongolia is a poorer country than Japan, with a much tougher life for the average person, so it's a bit like an African football player coming to England or Spain. They're incredibly motivated to succeed. A few months ago, I came across a documentary on YouTube with footage of Hakaho as a teenager when he had just arrived from Mongolia. And he looked like a skinny little frog. He was tiny next to the experienced wrestlers. He's a lot bigger now, but he's still not one of the biggest wrestlers. In sumo, there are no weight classes, so he's often fighting guys who are larger and heavier than him, which means he relies on skill and cunning as much as strength. In the documentary, he explained that when he first arrived, he had to eat and eat in order to build himself up to fighting size. Like all the other wrestlers, he had to live and work in a communal building, getting up early to clean the house and prepare meals for the senior wrestlers. When I saw the footage of the wrestlers sleeping in a dormitory, training on a hard, sandy ring early in the morning, pushing heavy equipment about, pushing heavy sumo wrestlers about, I realised it's an incredibly hard life, and you have to be extremely tough to succeed. So now, when I watch Hakaho throwing other wrestlers around like cushions, it's even more amazing to consider that he wasn't born as a giant of the ring. He built himself, physically and mentally, into the champion he is today. Day by day, for years, he put in the hours on the training ground. He took the knocks, he took the falls, and he kept getting back up again. Then he worked his way laboriously up the ranks, winning over a thousand fights on his way to the top. And now, he's king of the hill. And all the wrestlers below him are busting a gut every single day to knock him back down again. So it looks like the greatest sumo wrestler of all time was made and not born. What separates him from the others isn't gigantic size or superhuman strength. It's his hunger to succeed, to keep pushing himself harder than anyone pushes him from the outside. In my own work, having spent over 20 years coaching creatives and seeing up close what it takes to make it, I'd say the hunger to succeed is a bigger factor than native talent. Yes, some people, maybe most creatives, do seem to have a gift for some aspect of artistic expression. But it's easy to fritter away your talent if you don't work at it. And others, who start out with seemingly more modest gifts, can achieve amazing things through hard work, practice and persistence. For example, Here's a songwriter looking back on his early years. See if you can guess who's speaking. I didn't know how to write a song. I wasn't particularly good at it. I forced myself to be a good songwriter, and I became a good songwriter. But I had no natural talents whatsoever. I made a job of work at getting good. So who was this guy with no natural talents whatsoever? David Bowie. Well, even allowing for a little modesty, I think he did pretty well for someone with no talent. Now, you may not fancy your chances as a sumo wrestler, but any time you look at one of your creative heroes and you're tempted to put him or her on a pedestal or to ascribe their success to some God-given talent, I suggest you do some research about their early years. Chances are you'll find someone with a little talent a lot of doubts and insecurities, and a huge thirst for creative expression and professional success. Maybe someone very like you when you started out. To me, this is tremendously encouraging, because it means wherever we start from, there's a hell of a lot we can do to influence our destination. Like what?
you may ask. Obviously, practice is essential. You only get to be insanely good at something by doing a lot of it. But it's not just about putting in the hours. You also need the challenge and feedback that come from getting in the ring with people who are bigger and better than you are. So I suggest you follow in Hakaho's footsteps and seek out the hardest, toughest school you can find where you're out of your depth to begin with, but where you have the biggest potential to learn. In my twenties, every so often I would dip my toe into a writing class, but I wasn't particularly serious about it. And it didn't help that each class I turned up at, I seemed to be at the top, or pretty near the top, in terms of the standard of my work. Because this made me lazy. It seemed to confirm that I had talent, and that I was on the right track. But actually, it meant I had chosen a class that was too easy. Then, 15 years ago, I walked into Mimi Calvati's class at the Poetry School in London. Within a few minutes, I realised I wasn't even in the top half of this class. It was a bit of a shock to the system. When I'd been to other classes, the teacher had praised my poem by picking out the one or two lines that I already knew were good and patting me on the back for them. But Mimi would say things like, Mark, there are a couple of good lines in this poem, so why don't you make the rest of the poem as good as that? After I got over the initial shock, I realised I was in the right place. The top students were so much better than me, and Mimi clearly knew so much more than I did, that there was a massive amount for me to learn. Fifteen years later, I still have a lot to learn. But when I look back at the poems I was writing then, and the work I'm doing now, it's night and day. And I'd never have come this far without Mimi's class. So, your mission should you choose to accept it, is to find the toughest, most ambitious school that has the most to teach you. I don't know what that will look like for you. A formal course in a big college, or a series of meetings with a wise old lama on top of a mountain in the Himalayas. But I do know it's out there for you, if you look hard enough. If you're enjoying the 21st Century Creative, you may like to know there is more to this podcast than meets the ear. To help you succeed in your creative career or business, I've created an in-depth program, the 21st Century Creative Foundation Course. It covers the personal and professional skills you'll need to succeed as a creative professional in the 21st century. In other words, the stuff they probably didn't teach you at art school on your creative writing masters, or wherever else you learned your craft. Things like how to manage your time, how to communicate your ideas, how to handle difficult conversations, how to close a sale, how to deal with money, how to grow your network, and how to attract an audience for your work. Altogether, there are 26 lessons in the course, full of practical advice, plus a worksheet for each one to help you put the ideas into practice. And I'm giving you the entire course for free. In case you can't quite believe your ears, go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash free course and see for yourself. When you get there, you can sign up with just an email address and you'll get your first lesson right away. By the way, The course has already been taken by over 11,000 students. And on the sign-up page, you'll see lots of testimonials from other creatives whose lives and careers have been changed by the course. You can join them right now for free by going to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash free course. When I talk to clients who work in theatre, and mentioned that I've been taught by Kristin Linklater, they go a little weak at the knees. Because Kristin is a world-renowned teacher of voice work for actors. She's taught workshops in many countries and held positions at a number of academic institutions, most recently as Professor of Theatre at Columbia University, New York. During her time in America, 
Christian also co-founded the theatre company Shakespeare and Company, and then created the Company of Women, an all-female Shakespeare company. Christian is a native of the Orkney Islands, off the north coast of Scotland, and these days she teaches at her own purpose-built residential voice centre on Orkney, in a spectacular setting. It's within sight of the sea and within walking distance of a 5,000-year-old Neolithic village. She's the author of two influential books, Freeing the Natural Voice and Freeing Shakespeare's Voice, which have sold over 150,000 copies and been translated into six languages. As the book titles suggest, she's an authority on speaking and performing Shakespeare and also other forms of poetry. So I first heard about Kristen from some of my poet friends who told me about an amazing teacher who had not only transformed their reading style, but also changed their fundamental relationship with their own poetry. Well, with a recommendation like that, I had to go and investigate for myself. In the past 18 months, I've attended two courses in Orkney, one on introductory voice work and another focusing on Shakespeare. And I discovered that Kristin is a truly amazing teacher. Working with her has been one of the most profound experiences of my life. And I'm talking about life as a whole, not just training courses. And I return from my second trip to Orkney, bearing a gift for you. I asked Kristin if she would be willing to be interviewed for the podcast. And she kindly sat down with me after the course and gave me what I think is an extraordinary interview. So, if you're listening to this and you're an actor or a singer or if you use your voice professionally in any way, this conversation is essential listening for you. And even if you're not an actor or performer, don't assume voice work has nothing to do with you. It may be more important than you think. As you'll hear in the interview, it's not only helped me give better poetry readings, it's given me a different connection to my voice as a writer and made it easier for me to actually write poetry. One of the nice things about interviewing a great voice teacher is that you can actually hear what she's talking about in the tonality of her voice as she describes it. So listen carefully to this one. And before we hear the interview, I'd like to say, if you are an actor or if you use your voice in any way for your work, or even if you're just curious about developing a deeper and more creative relationship with your own voice, I urge you to go to linklatervoice.com and sign up for Kristin's course, Introductory Linklater Voice Technique. One week with Kristin and your relationship with your voice will never be the same again. So, without further ado, here is Kristin Linklater. Kristin. A lot of people would, I think, associate voice coaching or voice training with a somewhat artificial process. And yet your first book is called Freeing the Natural Voice. How can coaching free a natural voice? It is a process of undoing, undoing habits of speaking and allowing the natural range and ability of the human voice to be revealed. We were all born with a free voice. You've only got to listen to babies uh, to know that they, <laughs> they are not being coached into expressing their feelings. Yeah. Then, of course, in order to adjust to society and uh, to be acculturated into any community or family or school or surroundings, we have to put the lid on our absolutely free emotional expression and begin to be polite, uh, behave, speak in the way that other people think we should speak. And that puts all sorts of stoppers onto the voice, onto the original human voice, that are in the body in the form of tensions. So the stomach begins to tighten up in order to hold on to breathing because the breathing will reveal emotion. 
the throat begins to tighten up in order to compensate for the lack of a free breath. And one way or another, in the course of growing up, it's very likely that we lose contact with the true free voice that we were, that was our, our birthright. There is a, a human instrument that is expressed through the music of the voice, but the voice, if you work on the voice in terms of its musicality, on the musical instrument, there's a real tendency to cut off from its originating impulses, which are the impulses of thought and feeling. The difference between coaching and what I do is probably that in coaching, people work on the result, the way people speak and try and make it better. So they go, they say, go faster, go slower, go louder, go softer. Uh, that's a resultant kind of managing of the voice. And what I do is say, all those dynamics are the dynamics of thought and feeling. Uh, what you need to do is get rid of your inhibitions. That's a big one. Uh, and how they manifest in physical tension. And begin to explore the, 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 the risky business of saying what you think and saying what you feel, and then what comes back, and then answering that. And then there's some real conversation going. But it's a tricky thing coming into the real cause of the voice. The, what makes the voice work is emotional nourishment. It comes, the voice runs on emotion and breath, a free breath, free breath. That's a whole subject. Well, it's, it's a whole experience. I mean, I've just been working with you for the second week, second intensive week that we've done this, and my whole experience has been very different to what I expected. You know, I was thinking maybe we would do lots of abdominal strengthening and mm. building strength <laughs> and volume, but, I mean, you started off with us with just teaching us to relax and relax and teaching us how different parts of our anatomy, parts like the jaw, the throat, the, the diaphragm, how all of these are working together in concert to produce a voice. And I think my experience of it, of it has you been gently nudging me to get out of my own way more and more and, and trusting that something will come out of that. I mean, whenever you, you coach us, you never tell us how to say a line or how to speak something. It's not my experience is it's just you're creating the space for that to open up and then what naturally comes in. Yes, it's the difference between saying, how am I going to speak this? Yeah. Or saying, why am I saying it? Mm. So you're looking for the why. What do I want to say? Why do I want to say it? Uh, not how should it be said? Mm. So that's really dealing with the cause, uh, the, the causal thought the causal feeling and the causal thought. And that's going to, and I'm asking you to let that causal feeling, causal thought be the thing that activates the breath that then makes the voice. This whole process, how the voice works in the body is extraordinarily complex. It's an amazing coordination of breath and feeling and vocal folds and little laryngeal muscles and uh, uh, the breathing muscular it's musculature itself is so complex that we can't really do it any good by trying to understand it and manage it. So I ask you not to manage your breath, mm -hmm. not to control your breath, but to relax your belly muscles and observe your breath, to allow the breath to enter and leave and let the breath come as freely as possible without controls. Now, a lot of people who work on voice find that idea uh, alien. There's a lot of talk about breath control. Mm. If you start to consciously control the outflow of breath, you're actually limiting the capabilities of your breathing musculature. 
it's almost impossible to explain what I, <laughs> what I, what I, what I mean by that. Um, the breathing happens on the involuntary musculature under the control of the involuntary nervous system. So if you bring in conscious muscles to control the outflow of breath, um, you are doing something quite clumsy in comparison with the sophistication of actual uh, natural deep involuntary breathing process. So uh, I will say over and over again, feed in the impulse for a deep sigh of relief, a deep pleasurable sigh of relief, which is quite different from saying, take a big breath. Yeah. If you take a big breath, you're using muscles to control. If you feed in the impulse for a deep sigh of relief, your breath knows, your breathing muscles know what to do. And it's, you're connecting the part of your brain that feels, because it's a relief, it's pleasurable relief, yeah. that has feeling in it, with the actual an anatomical response to that. When I say the part of the brain, we have to take into account that the neuroscientists now know that we have neurons in the gut. So gut brain implies all our sensory organs, all our sensual and sensory response mechanism. And it's that that provides impulse for the breath. A deep sigh of relief comes from the intelligence of the sensory life in the middle of the body. So we're not controlling the voice from the frontal lobes of the brain, from the head, mm -hmm. but influencing the voice from the feeling sources in the middle of the body. Now that's where the diaphragm is. So the diaphragm is going down and up inside the body. It's a passive muscle. You can't tell the diaphragm what to do, but you can influence it. You can influence the involuntary musculature by images, through images, through sensory images, through feelings, through picturing your anatomy, through imagining something happening to you. So the imagination can trigger the involuntary musculature. We work a lot with imagery, with both anatomical, accurate anatomical imagery and then imaginative imagery sparking the activity of the involuntary breathing musculature. So the diaphragm is very close to the largest, I think, nerve center in the body, which is the solar plexus. And experientially anyone, I think, will agree that the solar plexus, this central bit of the body, is the part that feels things suddenly. Hmm. Sudden surprise, sudden fear, sudden excitement yeah. uh, is registered somewhere in the middle of the body. Well, the breath can pick that up and let it be revealed through the voice. So that nerve center, the solar plexus nerve center, is crucial to the expressivity of the human voice. And that's just one part of the breathing musculature. The other deep part, which isn't nearly so much understood, is called the diaphragmatic crura. And there are muscles that go down through the, to get a bit um, an anatomically accurate, mm -hmm. the psoas muscle, the deep inner muscle, involuntary muscle, that goes down through the lumbar spine and into the pelvic floor. And there, there is another big nerve plexus, the sacral nerve plexus. And as far as I can tell, that nerve plexus is the home of instinctive and intuitive impulse. So we've got some of the breathing muscles responding to instinct and intuition, and some of the breathing muscles, the diaphragm, responding to emotional impulse, if you allow them to do that. Well, for some people, they find that a bit alarming. Well, it was, I mean, for me, it was, firstly, it was really surprising. I remember the first day 
working with you when you taught us to sign. You said you don't need to make an effort to breathe. Right. You know, and of course hands went up. We said, well, what if we want to have a, a, a you know higher volume? We want to be heard on the other side of the room. And you were still saying no. You can you can sigh and. It, it was kind of a relief to learn that. <laughs> you can sigh out your big stuff. Right. See, it's a relief yeah. to get rid of a big feeling of anger. Yeah. yeah. It's still an outgoing relief. Yeah. The sigh, the, the, the experience of that sigh is much more powerful yeah. inside so that you will have stronger impulses that will trigger a stronger response in the involuntary musculature. Hmm. We don't go around all, all the time saying, oh, I'm feeling so sweet and calm <laughs> and relieved. You know. No, but the body likes to sigh. Yes. And it's not only sighing out uh, at the end of the day, collapsing onto the sofa in front of the TV. It's sighing out, I... I'm having a horrible day today. Oh, that feels better. Yeah. I said that. It's what I was feeling and I didn't let it out. Yeah. I am so angry at what just happened. Oh, that feels better. I actually expressed what I felt. Yeah. It's a relief. Well, I mean, that's... Does that make sense? Yeah, and it certainly, it chimes in very strongly with my former life as a psychotherapist. Ah. The expression of emotion in itself is, is therapeutic, as, as long as it's done in an appropriate way. Um, but what you're doing is you're, you're really helping us embody that and practice it on a very deep level. And, you know, it, it also made the whole process a lot... In some ways it's harder because... I. I became aware of all the tension I was holding, but it, in other way, it's easier and more enjoyable because ultimately you, you just, and, and this goes right through life. You, if you, you know, if you just sigh and you let go of whatever you are holding on to, or you, or you let it out in speech, it's like you say, it's pleasurable, even if it's yeah. an uncomfortable emotion. It doesn't. There are situations in life where. We find ourselves holding our breath and getting you know, the fists clenched or the shoulders come up or the jaw gets tight. It actually isn't doing anything for anyone, yeah. that tension. As soon as you notice tension and jaws, shoulder, neck, hands, those are sort of belly, those are kind yeah. of key places. As soon as you notice it, why not just let it go and then see what happens? Mm -hmm. Actually, you can deal with situations of stress uh, much better in a state of relaxation than in a state of tension. Yes. It's no good relaxing in a relaxing atmosphere. I mean, yes, it's nice to yeah. relax in a relaxing atmosphere, but that's not what the relaxation awareness is about. Mm. We're discovering relaxation through noticing unnecessary tension. We're discovering how to let that tension go so that when things get tough, yeah. we can stay relaxed. And you're relaxing in order to do something. So the tension, the energy that gets held in tense muscles redirects. And in my area of activity, redirects into the voice. And then the voice can be of help in the situation of, of stress, let's say, or danger. Yeah. Or argument, if, it, if that content, that emotional content stays in the, the holding muscles, it's doing nobody any good. It's, it's, it's pointless. So you might as well relax and then see what happens. Right, right. It also reminded my uh, Aikido sensei, Tony Eccleston, was, he was always trying to get us to relax on the mat. Yeah. He says, because then you'll relax, hopefully, if you practice enough, you'll relax enough if, if you're in, ever in a situation where you need these skills because you, you can't help yourself. You're going to risk injuring yourself or getting injured, you, you know, or, or even injuring the other person if you're using your strength inappropriately. So, <clears throat> Yeah, I, mean, I, I was in New York just a couple of weeks ago and um, you can imagine there's considerable contrast between Orkney Yes, where I yes. live, <laughs> and New York. 
And going anywhere by a cab in New York mm. is quite often a terrifying experience. Some of them just whiz through those yeah. streets. And that's a place, and I, I notice myself tightening, I notice myself holding my breath, I notice my buttocks tightening and my legs tightening. And I think it's actually not, I'll probably survive much better if the cab crashes, it, well, if I'm in a relaxed state, if my body is relaxed rather than tense, you know, my injuries will be fewer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, that's a good, the, those moments are, are interesting to, to yeah. spot and say, I have a choice. Yes. So Where uh, are we, though, in okay. this whole thing about voice? So relaxation is where you start. Uh, but as you say, when you relax, when you get in touch with the diaphragm, the solar plexus, the emotional brain, there are all kinds of emotions there, and that can be quite scary for some people. I have worked in my life mostly with actors. And that gives me a very useful context for this kind of work. Actors have to have their full emotional range at their disposal for their art. Yeah. Thus, when I work with actors, I can say the art of theatre demands yes. that you allow your tears to flow, you allow your rage full range, you allow you to feel whatever it is you feel, so that you are in charge of your emotions your emotions are not in charge of you. For a lot of people, they keep their emotions under lock and key. They keep them held in because they're terrified of them. Yeah. If they undo, if they relax and let the feelings out, then those feelings are going to take over and overpower them. So, and as long as that fear of the emotions is there, then they are indeed dangerous. However, if you let a little bit of emotion out, just even in a sigh of relief, and then another little bit of emotion out, just a little bit of irritation, let's say, <laughs> another little bit of irritation, uh, irritation, a little bit of emotion out, maybe in an expression of pleasure. Then you start to exercise your emotions, you get interested in them, and you say, these are my emotions. This is what makes me a human being. The full range of emotional existence. So, if I start uh, exploring those emotions, then maybe I can be the captain of my emotional ship mm -hmm. and not be taken by sudden storms that leave me wrecked on some desert island. That's a good <laughs> metaphor, isn't it? Do you understand what I mean yeah, by that? Yeah, that's, that that's a lovely um, metaphor. Yeah. And, 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 of course, that for actors is where we're incredibly privileged and very lucky because we have texts yeah. that we can uh, exercise our emotions on. We can take these huge speeches from Shakespeare, we can take fantastic poetry and really use those texts because those, a great poet, a great playwright takes the emotional existence of human beings in conflict onto the stage. Otherwise, it's not a very interesting play. You've got to have conflict, you've got to have emotional uh, uh, events that keep the audience interested. They want to, the audience wants to see people suffering or, or uh, in great pain or uh, uh, surviving huge outrageous events. <clears throat> so on the stage, we get to enter into big emotional experiences, which, thank God, may not be our experience on a weekly basis. Exercising the emotions for actors is part of their training, yes. and they have these texts to exercise on. So listening to you say that, you know, it's made me think back on the past week where we've been working on Shakespeare text as a group 
And we've been on a real emotional roller coaster. Just about every conceivable emotion has come out of somebody's throat at some point this week. But I think I realized by the end of the week, we were all playing with them, you know. Yes. And they weren't as scary. I mean, we could go in and we could go out and you never entirely get comfortable with, with rage or fear, but you, at least you get the sense that you can dance with it, you can move with it. it go, it's as elemental as saying, oh, there's huge rage in the room or there's huge grief or there's huge pain in the room and I didn't die. Yes. Oh. Yeah. That's the fear. And that, f that fear, on the, again, on the psychological level, tends to have been uh, inculcated in us when we were very small. So all too often, small children have been, one way or another, prevented from expressing rage, fear, sadness by behavioral norms that adults want to lay on them. And the prevention may be quite benignly administered in terms of, you shouldn't do that. Hmm. Or less benignly in, don't do that. Yeah. Or worse still, you'll get a beating if you do that. Yeah. And very badly indeed, if you open your mouth about that, you will, I'll kill you. And, but even if it's just, don't do that, <laughs> what happens in a small child's tender psyche is, I'll die. Yeah. It's life or death at that age. Because that goes back to the baby being born, the breath coming in, the baby's body lives, and then the baby wails, the baby gets food, the baby survives. So what the baby's first experience is, I breathe, I live, I wail, I survive. And then when they come to words, yeah. they discover, actually, that doesn't work. It's no longer, I wail, I survive. It's, I wail and somebody's going to stop me wailing, and I'll die. Yeah. And that's sort of built into the psychophysical experience for many people, I would say the majority, yeah. of, um, because of we, we have to have a society that behaves in a certain way, so that, that, that's, that's in a way inevitable. Um, but once you get beyond that, once you've experienced as an adult where you can make the choice and logically you know, I'm not going to die if I take King Lear and bellow him out. I'm not yeah. going to die if... What were the other Shakespeare's speeches that, 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 uh, we, that, we, that we came up with? Well, Coriolanus, you know, I'm not going to yeah. die if I speak like that. Uh, um, I'm not going to, and then you do this huge, you say this huge stuff, and you may find yourself weeping, you may find yourself shouting, and actually, there's a kind of exhilaration. Yes, yes. And you feel, oh, I'm more alive yes. when I let this feeling come out in words that I've been given by this writer. Right. That's where actors are lucky. Right, right. So the, the, the writer gives us permission. Yes, and once we've got that permission, we let the emotion go and you find then, oh, emotions are the energy of life. Yes. That's what brings me to life. Yes. Okay, so staying with professional actors just a little longer, I mean, you've worked with lots and lots of actors. What is, would you say, some of the biggest pitfalls you see in the way they approach using the voice? Well, there's... There's very often an emphasis on projection, that a voice has to be thrown forward in order to be heard, in which case it's usually not very interesting to listen to. And the actor is doing two things at once, both experiencing the story on stage and at the same time part of him or her is throwing their voice forward. Yeah. And that 
that's a very unsatisfactory and unartistically satisfying um, experience. The alternative to that is to say, is to feel I am going to share what I'm, what I'm thinking and feeling in this situation on the stage with the people in the back row through the freedom of my breath and my voice. And then there's something rather magical happens, which is that the, that intention of sharing through to the back wall, to the people in the back row, you don't have to speak loud, but the openness itself, the openness of intention, brings an energy that is probably something to do with uh, electromagnetic currents mm -hmm. that go through the air and actually land on the bodies of the audience, not just on their ears. So that's one thing, the projection problem. The other thing is, oh, there's so many complex, complicated things. Uh, actors are so often told that the addiction is bad. They should be more mm, articulate and then they start to do speechy things and their lips and tongues start to work much more extravagantly than they need to in order to apparently be clearer. Clear diction is clear thinking. You do have to limber up your lips and tongue. Yeah. Just get them limber, get them alive. But then you leave them alone and they can pick up with great economy the subtlety of thought. So over-articulation is a problem that we quite, quite often see with, with actors and, and very much not trusting the emotional, the emotional content of what they're saying. What occurs to you? What are you thinking well, about? Well, I'd like to pick up on the point about projection and also the word trust, which I think is really important in your work, because I can imagine somebody maybe listening and thinking, well, that's all very well, but I'm not really sure that I would be able to reach the back row of a theatre if I was relaxing and I wasn't putting a lot of effort into projecting. And I remember the first week I came to work with you, it was a real surprise for me. You know, we spent several days hardly speaking in terms of speaking text. We were doing lots of vocal exercises and relaxing and waking up different parts of our anatomy. And then it was, the, I think, the third or the fourth day you got us to read our text, which in my case was a poem. And I couldn't believe it. It was like I'd been plugged into an amplifier. <laughs> and I really, I was, I, I kind of burst out laughing the first time it happened because I wasn't making an effort, and yet I could hit, hear it hitting the back wall. And I knew, you know, I could tell that people could hear it. So uh, it, it's well, there amazing. You are. I mean, that's it. The, so you say, what are the problems? Okay, you, you've, you've led me to the place that I should have started, probably. That one of the problems with actors is they don't warm up before oh, a show. Yes. yes. Um, uh, they think they can just get on and go out there on the stage. Uh, and very much with, with um, amateur actors, I think that's the problem too. So, so then you have to push to be heard, you have to start to shout to be heard. Whereas actually, what you've just described is, if I exercise, if I get the sounds going into my body, if I uh, warm up my voice, yeah. then it will grow. The voice actually grows inside, uh, the vibrations increase, it enlarges. And, but you do have to work on it. And, Actors have a tendency to be lazy. <laughs> and the difference between an actor and a musician, let's say, is that the actor's instrument, the actor's raw material is all him or herself, body, voice, emotion, imagination, and, in, and intelligence. And in a musician's case, that musician has to really practice. No musician would dream of, of, I don't know, saying, oh, I think I'll play the Moonlight Sonata tonight uh, without hours and hours and hours and hours of practice, 
getting their fingers going up and down the piano. Uh, the singer does hours of uh, warming up the whole range of the singing voice, etc. Yeah. The, the ballet dancer, the dancer of any sort is going to be warming up his or her uh, body before performing. Actors sometimes are a little lazy mm -hmm. in that regard. Okay. Well, again, you know, this chimes with my experience since I've been, between the first time I came to see you and, and the last time I've been working with one of your students, Nicola Collett, and I've also been practicing the exercises you gave me. And it, yeah, it does take a bit of time to do the exercises. Yeah. But even my, now I can physically feel a difference in my everyday speaking voice, you know, even when I'm not warmed up. And certainly when I do the warm-up, it's like, okay, the amplifier's been turned on again. Yes. You know, and not just volume, but I can hear and feel different tones and And you get connected. I know it's a, it's a, maybe this phrase is not so useful, but you get connected with yourself. So your voice is in your body and you realise, oh, my voice is me. So you're warming yeah. yourself up with a capital S. This, yeah, this is an idea. You, you said it to me on the first time I met you, and I'm still trying to get my head around. You know, your voice is yourself. Yeah. And yet it's it, it really starting to feel true for me. And here's something I've noticed again, because I'm also thinking if somebody's listening to this who isn't an actor, but they are a creative, you know, an artist of some kind, you know, and they're thinking, well, okay, well, how would this help me? One thing I've noticed, if, if I've done my voice warm-up in the mornings, it is an awful lot easier to write poetry that morning. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it just comes out You're much more You're not the slew. first one to say that, right. And if, if I'm too busy, doing air quotes, and I'm in a hurry to get on with my work, I usually suffer for that <laughs> because it's, it's harder. And there's definitely, the, maybe obviously for a writer, there's a connection between the voice and, and the written yeah. voice. But I really do feel much more connected. It's much easier to speak from that authentic place. I think that's to do with the fact that when you get free in breath and you get the feeling of the vibrations in your body, you're cultivating an ability to live a little bit more on the boundary between the conscious and the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind, how much more than the conscious mind? You know, it's like two thirds to a third, yeah. isn't it? If you think. It's a lot. So it, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody the knows what, the, what consciousness yeah. <laughs> is, right? Uh, but certainly it's from the unconscious mind that inspiration comes in, uh, in terms of creativity. Uh, in writing or inventing or uh, any kind of yeah, creative pursuit, the energy for that comes from the surprises, the things that move us forward into something, oh, that's fresh and new and extremely interesting. That comes from the huge resources of the energy of the unconscious mind. And I think by becoming aware of the breathing connected with emotion and the sound of the voice in the bones of the body, we are, can we say, waking up other deeper layers of the mind, the brain, both the brain in the head and the brain in the body, and uh, allowing, allowing, allowing uh, sparks of inspiration to be generated and it is an odd thing I think it does come from the voice uh, that I've noticed this a lot with writers who um, both prose writers and and poetry that after doing these voice exercises they are prolific <laughs> and I hope uh, also better <laughs> so Again, let, let's imagine somebody's listening to this who isn't a professional actor, mm. but they do have to speak in public sometimes. Mm. And maybe that is a scary prospect for them, maybe something that they think, oh, how am I going to get through this? Without going to the full range of training as an actor, what can we do 
to get more in touch with our natural voice when it comes to, say, speaking at work. There are some, there are some relatively simple or simple-sounding things that one can do, particularly with a good initial assessment, an honest assessment of how you, as a speaker, what the situation is and how you habitually respond to that situation. You've got to have really honest self-knowledge in order to, uh, to, to make any changes in that. There's no question that for a lot of people, speaking in public is terrifying. Some people think it's more terrifying than jumping out of a plane with a parachute or something. I wouldn't dream of jumping out of a plane with a parachute. <laughs> I'm a physical coward, but I'm, uh, I think, emotionally fairly brave. Uh, the getting up in front of an audience of any sort, whether it's, let's say, I don't know, in a corporate boardroom or whether it's uh, in front of an audience, you're reading your poetry for the first time, whatever it is, they're unknown. And atavistically, there's something in the brain that says they could kill me. And so it's a very legitimate condition, stage fright, yeah. fright, fear, nervousness, uh, shaking of the knees, shaking of the hand, dry mouth, tight tummy, and a constricted throat. I mean, those are some of the symptoms. Yeah. Some of this, the resultant speaking that comes from those symptoms are, I'm all on one note, uh, I, I go, I rush, I speak too fast, I make no differentiation between one thing and the next thing. There are so many different kinds of public speaking or speaking in public that there's no one solution that can cover all of those situations. But if you are standing in front of an audience, the awareness of your feet on the ground, it sounds so obvious, mm -hmm. but thinking down into your feet is... A, is a very simple and remarkably effective way of dealing with the most basic tremors of fear mm -hmm. that may come up when standing in front, is the contact that the soles of your feet have with the floor. Now, I think if you really, the, the, the reason that works so well as a calming down consciousness is that it brings your mind out of your the top part of your head and it brings your circulation, your chemistry even, yeah. down through your body and stabilizes you down through your legs and into your feet. Definitely the ability to say, can I relax my stomach? Yeah. Definitely the, the knowledge that what you have to say is worth saying. Really getting behind the the commitment that you have to the subject matter that, that you yeah. want to communicate. And I think the, the English particularly have a habit of self-deprecation and thinking, oh, I don't want to show off. Yeah. Uh, and that then dampens down the voice and de-energizes the self in really destructive ways. We've got to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get up in front of six people or 60 or 600, you have to know that A, they want to know what it is you're going to say. Yeah. And B, you have the right to say it. And C, you actually might do some good if you <laughs> say it. Right. right. And that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if people think you're being boastful. It doesn't matter if people judge you. You have committed yourself with integrity to what it is you want to say. So what it is you want to say, why it is you want to say it, the breath to say it with, really letting breath come into your body, feet on the ground. If you prepare something to be spoken, and if you're speaking poetry, you're reading poetry, yeah. then it's already there on the page. There is a form to it, and there is punctuation in there, and there's the punctuation of the form of your poem. But let's say you're 
talking about something totally scientific or uh, uh, business related and you've had to write something because it's very important. If you were doing a written speech, mark it. Use colored pencils to put the important words in red, mm -hmm. put the verbs in blue, uh, the descriptive words in green, and then rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Read it out loud over and over again yourself. If you can, put it on the page so that you know when you want to stop and leave a pretty interesting pause. <laughs> then do that. Mark it on the page. Score it in that way. Um, that's, what, that's what orators do. They don't go out there and just burble on. Yeah. They really have shaped it. They know the phrasing. They know the important things to underline. Their voice drops a little bit to pick up this important thing. And then there's a change. Yeah. And they say, and I really want you to understand this. This is the most important. So dynamics, where it's going slow, where it's going faster, where it's going a little higher, where it's going a little lower. That sounds very manipulative, but actually those, those dynamics in the voice should be a reflection of the changing dynamics of the content of what it is you want to say, the thought and the feeling. There are all sorts of strategies. You should certainly shake your body loose just before you go onto the stage. Feed in th three big sighs of relief before you go out on the stage. Get yourself undone from any nervous tension yeah. physically. So, okay, Christina, at this point, I invite my guest to set a creative challenge to the listener. So this is something that's obviously related to the theme of your work and that they can complete in the next five days. And Kristen has very kindly donated three copies of her book, Freeing the Natural Voice, which as usual will be, we'll you know, pluck the, the names of commenters out of the hat and three of you will get a copy of that book. So Kristen, what's your challenge for people this week? Ha. Huh. Hmm, well, I have a couple of things come to mind. One is uh, a challenge, a little difficult for those who live in cities, but is to go, if you live in the city, go out to a big park somewhere. If you live in the country, go out into the fields or up a hill and just breathe in the air around you lift your eyes up to the sky and call out ha to the sky and then let your eyes go to some horizon and call out hey to that horizon and you might even then stamp a little on the ground and go ho <laughs> <laughs> sounds pretty silly if they if they don't lock you up for doing something mad that that's really let your voice out of your body you know yeah. give it freedom somehow that's one thing and then i i i think it would be great if everybody chose a poem that has some personal relevance. Learn it by heart. Mm. That means it's not quite the same as memorizing. It's not sitting and going over and over and over it and banging it into your head and then reading it from behind your forehead. It's sort of lying on the ground or walking through the park and letting the images from the poem come into you and feeling your connection to the content of the poem. Now, here's the thing, learn the poem by heart. They've only got five days to do this. Yes. And then invite two or three friends in, or go and meet them in the park, and say, I'm going to speak a poem to you. <laughs> and, and watch the <laughs> and look of terror. <laughs> <laughs> so you learn the poem by heart, Yeah. speaking it out loud as you learn it, mm -hmm. 
out loud as you learn it and then speak it to somebody else. Wow. Well, I'm slightly biased, but I think that's a wonderful task. Do you? I think the yeah. world should, people should read more poems to each other. I absolutely agree. And also it's a wonderful thing because obviously if you pick a, a poem that means something to you, then that, that will connect you up with meaningful emotion. So That's the point. Great. Yeah. Christian, thank you so much. You've been incredibly generous today, as always, with your, your knowledge, your experience, your your guidance. Thank you. So just to help people find you online and also maybe explore your, your ideas and your work some more, where can people find you on the internet? Ah, if you go to Linklater Voice, and it's L-I-N-K-L-A-T-E-R, linklatervoice.com, mm -hmm. that will take you to the Kristen Linklater Voice Center. And that is a retreat-style residential studio workspace where people come from different parts of the world and we live together and work together for a week at a time on a number of different aspects of voice. There's inter introductory voice, advanced voice, there's Shakespeare work, there's poetry work, etc. But introductory voice just... Anyone can do it. Anyone can do introductory voice. They, you don't have to do it for a particular reason. You can come just because you're interested in finding out how your voice works. And my voice center is in the Orkney Islands. And it's, uh, it really is a retreat from the busyness of everyday life to come and spend time with yourself and your voice and other people doing the same thing. Well, and I just let me say on a personal note, I mean, we can look out the window here and see the most stunning landscape and seascape of hills and, and sea. There's a Neolithic village at the bottom of the hill that's 5,000 years old or something. And it's, it's really a magical experience to come to Kristin's retreat center. That She's got a purpose-built voice studio there is a very comfortable accommodation right next to it, and there's a lovely central kitchen and living room area. We all um, eat together. We all sit around the fire and have a glass of wine in the evening. There was even some singing last night. Uh, and it's, I, I've been twice. I will certainly be coming back in future. And it's, it's a really magical experience. You, you get to experience these ideas in the real core of your being and in, in a lovely supportive atmosphere and the people that you will meet. I mean, there's quite a few actors, but there's also you know, people like me who are writers. There's, I think we had a singer this week as well. And, and also some people who are really primarily interested for their own, say, business or work presentations. So yeah. I would say if you're remotely in, interested, then it's really worth making the effort to come to Orkney. Well, thank you, Mark, for speaking about it in that eloquent way and heartfelt way. And I know that you, you feel that it very is. strongly. Yeah. Some people think it's like a voice spa. That's right. Yeah, that's what we've been calling it. Because it is, you've, it's, you, you feel you, better. You feel, you feel better, better when you come at out. the end of the week, don't yes. you? You feel better. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and we'd right. better not forget your two books, Kristen. So we've mentioned Freeing the Natural Freeing the Voice. Freeing the Natural Voice which is, and then the subtitle is Imagery and Art in the Practice of Voice and Language, which I think is important. And then the other one is Freeing Shakespeare's Voice, and that's a how-to. How, how do you get into speaking Shakespeare's text? How do you find the clues, the forensics of Shakespeare's text speaking? And again, if you're remotely interested in poetry, or certainly Shakespeare, that is a, a mind-blowing book. I mean, I studied Shakespeare for my English degree, and I came to this, and it gave me a whole new way of looking at really? Shakespeare. Oh, so, that's great to hear. And, and certainly would, to go and, and speech it, and speech, speech it, it, speak it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. speech the speak, um, again, just takes it to a whole new level. It's so fun, even, isn't Even if it? you think isn't you know it? your Shakespeare well, it's, it's really worth checking that one out. Yeah, yeah, I love doing the Shakespeare workshops. Yeah. So, Christine, Great. thank you so much. That's thank been you. a real uh, joy for me to listen to, I'm sure for people listening all over the world as well. Um, and 
if you are listening to this and you want to take part in Kristen's challenge, then keep listening. Just after the break, I will give you the instructions on how the creative challenge works. In just one moment, I'll tell you how you can take part in this week's creative challenge. But before that, I'd like to ask you to do one small thing that will make a really big difference to the show. And that's to pop along to iTunes and press the little purple subscribe button. And if you're really feeling full of enthusiasm for the 21st century creative, maybe you could leave a brief review explaining why you like the show. The reason for this is that it wakes up the little gremlins inside the iTunes store. Because there's so many shows, the gremlins can't be expected to figure out which ones are good and which ones will appeal to this person or that person. Plus, they're gremlins. They don't have your good taste and discernment. So they're relying on you to press the subscribe button, to leave a review or a rating, because that lets them know that this kind of show is the kind of show that appeals to this kind of person. In other words, other people of creativity, good taste and discernment. And the Gremlins will put the show in front of them and more people will discover it, they will benefit and critically, the Gremlins can knock off work early. So please, consider the Gremlins. Press the magic subscribe button. Leave them a review. So Kristen has given you an interesting creative challenge, which on one level is about your voice, but on another level it occurs to me that it's about your relationship with other people. And I'm guessing that coming from Kristen, that's not accidental. If you want to take part, here's how the challenge works. Firstly, just to recap Kristen's challenge, she's given two versions of it, so you can do either one. The first version, go out to the countryside, or if you're in the city, to a big park, so that you're alone, or at least anonymous. And in a loud voice, shout firstly up to the sky, Ha! Then to the horizon, Hey! Then, finally, down to the ground, Hoo! And remember those different sounds, because, like everything with Kristin, they are significant. Second version. Choose a poem that has some personal meaning for you and learn it by heart. And as you do so, let the images of the poem really enter your mind and your imagination and notice the feelings that are aroused by the images. And once you've learned it, then read it aloud to two or three friends. And as I say, for the sake of the challenge and your own development, ideally I suggest you do both versions, but I'll accept it if you do either one. Secondly, once you've completed the challenge, go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash 9 and tell us how you got on. You have until midnight United States Pacific time this Friday, 28th July 2017 to complete the challenge and leave your comment at 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash 9. Obviously, if you're listening after that date, the challenge has now closed, but you can still take part in future creative challenges. Once the challenge has finished, I will pick three winners at random from the comments who will receive the prize of Kristen's book, Freeing the Natural Voice. As usual, I'm not judging, I'm just picking the winners at random. Over the weekend, I will send out a bonus recording with my feedback on your comments and what we can all learn from the challenge. I'll also be sharing reflections from my own experience as a reader of my own poetry, as a public speaker, and also as a student of Kristin's. As usual, the feedback recording will not be released on iTunes. It will only be available via the 21st Century Creative email list. So to join the list, go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash bonus and enter your email address in the box. Okay, that's it for Kristen's challenge. You will also find these instructions at 21stCenturyCreative.fm 
fm slash nine. And stay tuned for Monday when we will have the final episode of season one of the 21st Century Creative. Thank you.